On the afternoon of June 24th, 1950, the peoples of free nations were shocked when communist-backed troops crossed the 38th parallel into the Republic of South Korea, thus igniting the fires of a shooting war that could erupt into World War III. Within two days, on June 26, Washington acted. It was an order for the intervention of United States Air and Sea Forces, an action taken in support of United Nations efforts to restore peace in the tiny Asiatic Peninsula. The next day, the United Nations quickly called for joint police action to halt the aggressor. So, for the first time, the United States announced a policy of hitting back at red aggression, and an international body committed itself to moral and military might to preserve world peace and security. But communist forces had the initiative. Tactical surprise and overwhelming superiority of weapons drove a deep spearhead into South Korea's inadequate defenses. The North Koreans were quick to capture Seoul, the southern capital, and drive across the Han River when the South Koreans dropped back in confusion, blowing up bridges but hardly slowing the Red Advance. It was at this point that the United States Air Force and Naval units went into action. Japan-based planes strafed and bombed northern captured airfields, railroad yards, bridges, and other military targets, as well as supply dumps far behind the line. Dogfights with Russian-made yaks became more and more frequent as the war progressed. The American fleet, meanwhile, shelled communist beachheads and other coastal targets. Without the power of arms possessed by the North Koreans, the Americans and Southern natives put Herculean efforts into slowing the Red Drive. In the early morning hours of June 30th, the well-organized North Koreans pierced the Han River line and swept on to Su Wan, which capitulated July the 4th. As South Korean defenses continued to crack, a vanguard of American ground troops was flown across the strait to Pusan, key supply port, to help stem the tide. Korean civil strife actually began when the country was torn apart by an allied military agreement which established a temporary boundary between North and South Korea at the 38th parallel. This agreement directed Japanese troops in the south of that line to surrender to the United States, those in the north to Russia. The Russians chose to interpret the agreement as giving them the right to keep North Korea isolated behind an iron curtain. As a result of the Russian attitude, Korea found herself practically in a state of civil war. A temporary commission on Korea was designated by the United Nations to supervise free elections at the request of the United States. The Soviet Union refused to let the United Nations Commission enter its zone. Furthermore, they began a campaign of lies, threats, and instigated demonstrations aimed at stopping the election in South Korea. Despite all this, 90% of the registered voters went to the polls, but the 38th parallel became an armed frontier. On June 27th, President Truman made a momentous statement at Washington, D.C. Saying that the communists had passed beyond the use of subversion to conquer independent nations and would now use armed invasion, he ordered United States air and navy units to fight in Korea. Furthermore, he ordered the 7th Fleet to prevent any attack on Formosa, last stronghold of the Chinese government, while calling on the Chinese government to cease all sea and air operations against the mainland, with the 7th Fleet ordered to see that it was done. President Truman termed the Philippines another critical Pacific area and directed that the United States forces in the islands be strengthened and that military assistance to the Philippine government be accelerated. The president further ordered that greater military aid be sped to the French forces in Indochina and the dispatch of a military mission to provide close working relations with those forces. Thus, the United States acted quickly to checkmate any further red aggression. As South Korea found itself at war, 
scores of Americans and citizens of friendly nations were evacuated by both air and sea. They arrived at Itazuke Air Base near Fukuoka in southwestern Japan. In one day alone, more than a thousand evacuees were rescued without the loss of a single life. They were being flown in from Kimpo Air Base in Korea, an operation reminiscent of the Berlin Airlift. No sooner would a plane be unloaded than it would turn back to Kimpo to pick up more evacuees. It was a swift operation fraught with danger, for at this time the North Koreans were reported to be within five miles of that airbase. On June 28, the day following Washington's decision to use U.S. air and naval forces to fight with the Southern Army, the Swedish vessel Reinhold arrived at Fukuoka with more evacuees. Major General Dean, commanding general of the 24th Infantry Division, supervised the evacuation. And the care of the evacuees, including processing and billeting, was handled by a field artillery unit of the same division. They were individually escorted by soldiers and consisted mainly of women and children. About a hundred were processed every 40 minutes. A total of 682 were brought in by the Rhino. On leaving the registration building, evacuees were given transportation to their temporary billets. Many were sheltered at a local hospital. Stunned by repeated blows from the communists, the South Korean army attempted time and again to reorganize into new lines of resistance. Here at Suwon on June 29th, South Koreans left for the front. The South Korean 7th Division was fighting off attempts of the Reds to cross the Han River. Unlike the northern troops, many of whom fought with China's Reds in Manchuria, the South Koreans had few veterans. As troops moved to the battlefront, civilians fled in the opposite direction to avoid the northern invaders. Suwon, 20 miles south of the original capital of Seoul, temporarily became the headquarters of U.S. troops. And here, North Korean prisoners were brought for transshipment to the rear. At Suwon airstrip, south of Seoul, C-54s unloaded supplies for the sorely pressed South Korean army. Suwon, at this time, was the major U.S. supply base. Except for the field at the port of Fusan, 175 miles to the southeast, this was the only one capable of handling big transports. Unloading operations were interrupted time and again when communist planes strafed and dive-bombed the strip. A trickle of fire, starting in the right wing of this C-54, spread rapidly, eating its way down the wing, and in a matter of minutes had engulfed the plane. General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander for the United Nations Forces, traveled to Suwon airstrip on the fifth day of hostilities. This was his first trip to the front, but he returned for further observation later in July. One of his first orders was to destroy the last bridge over the Han River where North Koreans were massing. General MacArthur had not at this moment been named United Nations commander. That came within a matter of days after his visit to Korea. His first survey flight was brief, for more pressing matters awaited his attention at his Tokyo headquarters. Just before the general's arrival, Sungman Rhee, president of the Southern Republic, arrived with Ambassador John J. Muccio in two light observation planes. Flying in from the temporary capital at Tejan, they narrowly escaped an attack by a Russian yak plane. But the South Korean patriot seems little bothered, 
as he describes how they dived to treetop level to elude the North Korean fighter. On the 1st of July, the 1st U.S. ground troops, a battalion of the 24th Infantry Division, prepared to leave Japan for South Korea in an attempt to stem a communist armored drive that finally overran all resistance before the refugee capital of Chejun. This action immediately followed authorization from Washington to employ U.S. ground forces to repel the invaders, to use U.S. military aircraft against military objectives north of the 38th parallel and for a complete blockade of the Korean coast by the Navy. In these early days of the fighting, the men didn't have the equipment to halt the North Koreans effectively, but they never flinched in the face of beauty. The vanguard of ground troops arrived in South Korea. At this time, South Korean troops were attempting to form a new defense line along the Kum River, 60 miles south of Suwon and 10 to 15 miles north of the temporary capital of Taejeon. Then, en route to the front, where North Koreans manning Russian-made tanks have punched time and again through demoralized South Korean lines. At times, these tank spearheads had been 40 strong. And at Taejeon, South Koreans lined the streets to greet the American arrivals as they moved to the front, well realizing that it was only United Nations intervention that could possibly save them from red domination. A trainload of flat cars was loaded with hastily gathered fighting equipment for movement to a forward position near Pyeongchek. Then the troops scrambled aboard, moving to the front for their first taste of combat against the communists. It was not long before they contacted the enemy. Northern tanks were just behind this hill, and the troops tackled them with bazookas. This was before the arrival in Korea of the new 3.5 bazooka, which has proved so much more effective than the smaller bazooka developed in World War II. The Essex-class 27,000-ton aircraft carrier, Philippine Sea, prepared to sail from San Diego as efforts to strengthen the United Nations fighting arm gathered momentum. Jet fighters were loaded aboard. Their next flights to be against communist troops and installations. One of the jobs of the combined American and British naval craft is to maintain the blockade of the 1,500 mile long Korean coast. The main forces at General MacArthur's immediate disposal were elements of the 20-ship 7th Fleet detached from the job of protecting Formosa plus British warships in the area. In Japan on the 3rd of July, the sea movement of the 24th Infantry Division got underway. By this time, the South Korean army had been badly mauled. Communist invaders, under constant attack by United States and Australian planes, were attempting to build up bases to support a renewed offensive in the southern end of the peninsula. It was estimated early in the fighting that the North Koreans had launched their offensive with some 15 small divisions, or between 75 and 100,000 men. As troop reinforcements and materiel continued to flow to the fighting front, South Korean troops and their United Nations allies continued to fall back. Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson presented to Army Chief of Staff General J. Lawton Collins a United Nations flag for delivery to General MacArthur in Tokyo. And at the Washington, D.C. National Airport, General Collins was joined by General Hoyt Vandenberg, Air Force Chief of Staff.
they flew together for a Far Eastern conference with General MacArthur. The United Nations flag, which they brought with them, had been given to the U.S. delegate to the United Nations, Warren Austin, by U.N. Secretary General Trig Lee. It is the same flag that flew over the Ralph Bunch mission during the mediation in the Palestine War. General Collins presented the UN flag to General MacArthur. It is now flying in Korea concurrently with the flags of the various nations participating. The United Nations flag will fly over General MacArthur's headquarters until peace returns to Korea. On July 19th, President Truman told the nation and the world that the decisive action that the United States has taken in the Pacific with UN sanction is a milestone toward the establishment of a rule of law among nations. Far more important, the American people are united in their belief in democratic freedom. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high, but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost.